We are going to start this particular section on how to prepare your clients for an engagement session. Um, I think it's easy for us to think and show up and assume that our clients will show up and they will do exactly what we want them to do. Um, I, I kind of function this way. I like showed up and I hoped that things would work out and I functioned that way for actually a few months. And I have never been the type of person to tell other people what to do. Like side note, that is clearly changed now. But for the vast majority of my life, I was never a person who should say, you should do this, you should try that, you should go here. Not remotely at all. It has since changed and it's changed to better my business but also to better my life. And uh, because I had such a hard time telling clients what to do or what I think they should do, it manifested because it came to a head at an engagement session uh, during my second year of business when a client showed up over two hours late to the session, to this engagement session. And at this point, you're probably thinking, what were you still doing there? <laughs> two hours and some change after the start of it. And one thing that you will know about me shortly is I am determined. Like, I will stand you down. Like, there's just no way that I'm going to leave this engagement session. I'm gonna stay here, I'm gonna prove it. Like, you guys are hearing how ridiculous it sounds. Well, that was me at the time. And I called JD, and I was in Malibu, and Malibu, from Orange County is about an hour, but any traffic estimations in California vastly changes what that looks like. So if I were to leave the engagement session at that time due to traffic, I'd be in the car close to three hours. That's just what it is to live in Southern California. So I'm calling him every 15 minutes and like, they still haven't showed up. They still haven't showed up. And I would be getting text from the, the client or calls, and she would be like, oh, we're just exiting the freeway. And it's like 30 minutes later, girl, you did not just exit the freeway. Like, you just did not. And she kept on being like, oh, well, this happened. And oh, well, this happened. And I was so infuriated, and I felt so disrespected, that when she showed up, I was like, we have maybe 10 minutes of light. I will stay here and I will shoot this, but if you want to reshoot the engagement session, I'm going to have to come down and charge it separately as a separate engagement session. She's like, no, we're just thankful you didn't leave. Let's just do the session. And I'm like, in 10 minutes? And she's like, 10 minutes. I was like, okay. So I did the best I could. I ended up shooting at uh, the vast majority of it at around 1600 ISO. And I just thought, wow. So I get back in the car and I am just, can you believe the audacity, JD? Who does this? Who shows up two hours late to the shoot? Who has a 10 minute engagement session? And he just lets me have my tirade. And then he says, well, did you tell them why they had to be there on time? I was like, what do you mean? People should just be on time. And he's just like, well, yes, but if you don't tell people why they need to be on time, they will not understand that you can't do your job unless they show up and adhere to the things that you ask for them. And I was like, well, well then I'm gonna talk to somebody who supports me, okay. <laughs> but he was right. What this really boils down to is that I needed to explain. I needed to explain why they had to be on time. I'm a natural light photographer. If I lose the sun, I cannot possibly pursue with the engagement session. I tell my clients, if you show up 30 minutes late to your session, I will not extend the engagement session by 30 minutes. The sun dictates how and why I shoot. I say that now to every single client. You want to know how many clients have been late to an engagement session since that disastrous one? Zero. People know that they are spending money to get an engagement session and they're just not gonna lose it because they weren't trying hard enough to be there. I also needed to explain why guys, why it probably wasn't a good idea for guys to be wearing baseball caps and flip flops to their engagement session. That was a little uncomfortable. I had to explain that going to, a four, to going to four locations in one engagement session, probably not a good idea. I actually had to start teaching my clients what good ideas were and what not so feasible ideas were. Because if I didn't take time to explain it to them, I could not be frustrated if they themselves did not understand that. So basically what this means is I needed to prepare my clients for success. So how do I do this? I explain what they should expect and it comes in this way. So 
about a month before their engagement session, I email my clients and I, I give them four weeks advance notice because I cannot get into um, an, an email explanation one week and that could potentially change or pivot their expectation for the shoot. Four weeks, we can. So I outline what I want from their session. I, want, I say in this email, I want them to have a good time. I say in this email, I want them to get great photos. And I say in this email that it's a great opportunity for us to learn and see how we interact with each other before the wedding day. So I outline my goals. Secondly, then I list what I'm expecting from them. What I expect from them is to be on time, that they are eligible for one outfit change, and you can offer outfit tips if they need them. They get one location change. And what I also ask them to do is to ensure that that location or either of the locations don't have anything that could affect our shoot. It could be under construction. You might have to pay a shoot fee. You might need a permit. All of those things, I abdicate the responsibility to them to handle that. Because I don't want to show up to the engagement session and the client's like, Jasmine, why didn't you get the shoot permit? Because then I would think, well, you can get the shoot permit. Like, what? Like, I have to tell them, if we need one, you must get it. Now, then I request for, I refer to him as the groom, but it's usually fiance. 99% of my correspondence is with the bride. So in, in this case, also, when I say fiance, I largely mean uh, the, the, the counterpart to my client interaction. Request that your fiance watches engage, uh, slideshows in advance. Because what was happening was I would get these guys to come to shoots and the girls were excited and they're amped because they had been seeing my photos on Facebook. They were excited, you know, they were feeling good. And the guy would show up be like, yeah, you know, doing this for her. All right, so uh, how long is this gonna be? There's a game, right? Like, so we have been at this point where it's like, I, I don't know how to make you want this. But what I noticed is if, if I asked the, the girl to ask her fiance to watch the slideshow, he would then see how much it meant to her because he just thinks it's just a thing to check off of the wedding day things to do. And for her, she's like, oh, do you see it? Can you catch my vision? And he, most guys just, you know, happy wife, happy life. They'll just be like, okay. Then it changes the dynamic of how they get to the shoot being prepared. And then they know that I'm not there to make them look cheesy. I really want them to be confident in the approach of shooting when they have their fiance. Uh, then I ask um, them to, I encourage them to get their hair and makeup done. Um, it can be potentially uncomfortable to ask a bride to do this, but then I explain why. I say, if you're wondering how your makeup or hair will appear in wedding photographs, this would be a great trial run. Furthermore, most brides get a trial run for their hair and makeup before the wedding day, and then what happens is you get it done, and then you're gonna, are you gonna go grocery shopping after? You're gonna go bowling? Like, the fact that we can actually kill two birds with one stone is a great opportunity for you to see how it photographs. And then brides are mostly like, hey, that's a great idea. But from a logistical perspective, we know as photographers that when hair and makeup is professionally done, it photographs better. It simply does. So if you want something, it's totally okay to ask for it. And also, I, I, I ask to see if they're going to be, be bringing props. I don't want to show up to a shoot and then be like, oh, there's a sofa in a field, right? Then I need to figure out what, how does this change the logistical lay of the land? So I have to prepare myself and then I have to let them know what I'm expecting. Then it comes time for prep. So I've outlined my goals, I let them know what I'm expecting and then I prep them. I tell my clients that I want them to feel comfortable. So if you're starting to notice that there's going to be a pattern is I'm telling them what I want at minimum one month to the, to the engagement session. Then when we arrive at the engagement session, I'm telling them again, I want them to be comfortable. I encourage them uh, for freedom of movement. I come in and I say, I want your ideas. If you wanna go to a particular place, let me know. I tell them I shoot digitally. So if you see something that you think could potentially be a good idea, let me know, but then I follow up with, if it doesn't work, it won't make the edit, there's no pressure. Offering me the back door so that if the client's like, I wanna stand on this stump. I have really had a client, there was like a stump in just like this random park and she wanted her and her fiance to stand on the stump. And I'm like, and at this point, I had already given myself a back door saying, okay, if it doesn't work. So I was like, ah, 
totally, let's, let's stump this photo, right? Like, I'm like, great. It did not make the edit. And when she had said, oh, did any of those photos from the stump work out? And I said, unfortunately, the light wasn't right and it wasn't the most complimentary because you guys were at such a high angle. That was it. Had I not given myself the back door, she would have expected that photograph in her edit. Then I explain how beautiful I find confidence. I have to let them know I'm seeding already. You guys see that I want them to be comfortable, I want them to have a good time, and I explain that I like confidence. So then I'm already giving them the permission to be confident upon arrival. Lastly, I send ideas, encouragement, and if my clients are shooting at a location that I have shot at before, I send them links to engagement sessions that I have shot to give them an idea of what they can expect. Um, if a client wants to know what she should be wearing, if the location is okay, I want her to feel really good so that she's not second guessing everything. So that she did all the second guessing on the front end, I assuage those worries, she arrives looking and feeling beautiful, ready to deliver. Now, does it sound like a lot of work? Yes. But the more work you do in advance, the higher likelihood you are to be having a really, have a really successful engagement session. Now, I want to move now to the logistics of the shoot. So now we, we did the prep for the shoot, now I know what I do in advance, and now we're going to get to what it really looks like to ensure that my bases are covered on the day of the engagement session. So it sounds very basic, but check the weather. I live in California, which is really you know, great most of the time of the year, and even just coming before I came to Seattle, there was this freak rainstorm. It was like days of like 78, 78, and then boom. 60 degree day, which is I'm sure not very cold for a lot of you, but in California, it was like news reports. This just in, it hit 61 degrees. <laughs> Bundle up, ladies. It's like, okay, but for us, this is a big deal. And it also rained. So if I had an engagement session that I just assumed like, oh yeah, this week's great. What can go wrong? I would be doing a disservice to myself to at least let my clients know it will rain. But in other areas, I'm sure you guys are accustomed to this, but it never hurts to know what the, what the rain pattern will be. Um, have a plan B when it comes to weather too. Just because it, the, rain, the weather does change, I don't immediately go to let's change it. I go to how can we fix this? And if you will be unhappy, then, then let's get there. Uh, second point is to leave with plenty of time. And I know this seems like intuitive, but there is nothing worse than showing up late, even if it's five, 10 minutes. This is your first impression as a paid a, a creative member of their wedding team. And if you show up 10 minutes late to their engagement session, they're gonna wonder if you're gonna show up 10 minutes late to their wedding, and that's not gonna fly. Because here's the thing, always assume there's traffic, always assume there is an accident. Take a book with you, bring your computer with you, catch up with an email, be productive, but more than anything, err on the side. JD thinks I'm crazy. I leave hour, like an hour and a half in addition to what it normally would take me, and I'm like, I'm gonna take my book, I'm gonna relax, I'm gonna be at peace. Remember about creating that zone? That's, uh, that's what I definitely need to do. Um, thirdly, ensure you have the exact address. Now people will say, oh, we're gonna meet at Huntington Beach, or oh, we're gonna meet here. No, no, learn from my mistakes. A client had said, oh, we're gonna meet at Calamigos. She had just said Calamigos. And in my mind, at a different, uh, in my mind, when she said Calamigos, I assumed she meant Calamigos Malibu because I had no idea that there was a Calamigos elsewhere. And so I'm on my way feeling great. And this is a wedding day. This is a wedding day, okay? We leave the hotel and I think to myself, wow, we're driving a long way to get to Calamigos Malibu. And I'm going and something in my heart is just off. And I'm like, something's off. Something's really off here. So I go to my phone and I search Calamigos and I come to find out there's three or four Calamigos in Southern California. And then I, like, I put my head between my knees and I'm not like, I'm dry heaving. I'm like, <laughs> it's like JD, the wedding. Like I died, I died. And I was like, I don't know what you have to do. You get on this emergency exit and we just have to go. We just have to go. And he's like, okay, calm down, calm down. Thankfully, the limo got a flat tire. <laughs> Thankfully, we were saved. And I learned the most valuable lesson that day. I need an exact address. Even you could say loosely, even if there's only one Theo chocolate factory in Seattle, I need the address. It's my responsibility to get that. Uh, double check your, your, your gear. I uh, shoot on an engagement session. I keep what I shoot rather light. I don't want to be overcome with my options. So I shoot with the 50 millimeter 1.2, the 35 millimeter 1.4, and the 85 
Those are the three lenses that I use. I keep one lens on my camera, I keep two in my bag, and I also take a spare camera that I leave in the back seat of my car underneath the seat. So God forbid anything should happen with my camera the day of the shoot, say, hey, give me a couple minutes, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna get my spare. Um, an average engagement session, I'll shoot somewhere in the ballpark of eight to 10 um, gigs of memory, and we're gonna talk about what that looks like, and I shoot medium raw. Now, what I also want you to do is to cross-check for daily events at the venue. I heard of, uh, I spoke with a, a wedding photographer who had planned to do a downtown Los Angeles engagement session, and when she arrived about four, five, six miles from it, it everything was at a complete stop. And she had no idea why people weren't moving and why everybody was wearing running shoes. Unbeknownst to her, Los Angeles Marathon was going on that day. And so her clients are stuck in gridlock traffic, she's stuck in gridlock traffic, and it was a complete waste. They couldn't even get ultimately to where they wanted to go. Yes, theoretically, it was the client's responsibility to find that out, but anything day of, I also will cross-reference just to make sure. Now, we're gonna move now on to the engagement session. When the engagement session actually arrives, I arrive early and I scope out the location. Now, I arrive early because even if I have shot in locations before, you never know what could happen. Case in point, the not dream engagement session. She tells me where to meet. She tells me that they hike there all the time, all days of the, all days of the week, all hours of the day. So I said, great. So I arrive early, and I see that there's a gate in front of the public parking lot. And I'm like, why is this gate locked? I hop into my car and it's completely locked. There's not a single car in the parking lot. And I think to myself, okay, no big deal. I'm just gonna find parking elsewhere. We couldn't find parking for four miles on either, on either end. And there's a distinct sign to say, if you park at this Wayfarer's church, you're gonna get towed. And I'm like, wow, okay. So if I arrived early, it was so windy. I mean, it was like, Dorothy and Toto, windy. I was like, there's a house that's gonna land us. It's so windy, we can't get into this parking lot. There is no parking, what are we gonna do? So I call her and I'm just like, I let her know, this is the lay of the land. And she was like, I really, like, that's just, it's our space. And I was like, okay. And the cameras with Creative Live are there, so I'm trying to keep it together on the front end and I'm just like, oh! I was like, okay, no problem, no problem at all. Just bring a rubber band and some bobby pins because your hair is gonna be flying everywhere. We were able to park in 30 minute parking. There was two little parking spots. And we just said, if we get a ticket, this is the price we're gonna pay to shoot this engagement session because that is what she wants. I cannot pitch her anymore. So she knew. But had I not arrived an hour early, we would have been like, what the heck's going on? I didn't have enough time to tell her to bring a rubber band or bobby pins. I would have felt like completely off my game. When the clients do arrive, even though I, I had already given Samantha heads up, like, hey, it's very windy. Hey, it's very bright. And hey, you will have to park and there's a potential of your car getting towed. And she said, okay. I said, here we go. So when they arrived, because that was our very first interaction, it was the very first time, uh, I didn't even talk to her, I actually texted her. It was the very first time we had texted each other. Um, I didn't want her coming to the engagement session feeling apologetic or frazzled. So when she arrived, I immediately put her at ease. Hey, how's it going? So glad. Isn't this working perfectly? But I mean, it, it was like a wind tunnel. It's like, isn't this working perfectly? <laughs> um, but it's fine. So then I kind of dove into what I uh, call my welcome spiel. My welcome spiel is something, because you guys, know, because I've spoken about this in previous lessons, you know that I sometimes get frustrated with my in inability to articulate my thoughts. So I figured the more I say my welcome spiel, the more confident I'm gonna be as I approach the shoot. So what does my uh, welcome spiel include? My expectations. I have already emailed what those expectations are, right? You know what those expectations are, but I'm reminding them and I wanna put it in the forefront of their mind. I wanna give them permission, to, permission to be themselves, permission for ideas, and permission to be beautiful. Thirdly, I, sub, I, I subtly remind them of my goals. My goals are to get, give them great photos, to have, for them to have a great experience. And then I tell my clients that I have arrived early for the shoot and that I have a, a lay of the land, and that I can map out the session if they so choose, or if they have ideas, I wanna hear them. Then, lastly, in the back of my mind, I am focusing on the words that I want to shoot for. We're gonna dive more into that in a future lesson about what my words are and how I shoot with intention, but for now, 
My words, that have been my words for years, are fun, fresh, and editorial. As I approach my shoot, because I'm a lifestyle photographer and because I'm going to be a little bit more hands-on in curating my vision, every time I put my clients in a pose, I must make it one of three things, fun, fresh, or editorial. Now, an ancillary word, like a fourth word, that most photographers would just kind of encounter naturally would be romantic because Two people in love, that naturally happens. But I am not shooting with the intention of it being romantic. I am shooting with the intention of it either being fun, fresh, or editorial. Now, as I go through the shoot, I, I'm constantly letting my clients know how they're doing, offering feedback, and telling them where we are headed. I don't want to uh, have them second guess, and I want to stay one step ahead of my clients. I don't want them to say, where are we going next? Or how am I doing? Or how does my hair look? I want to be telling them so that the only thing they think about are my directives and them not having the headspace to actually say, do I look awkward? How do I feel? Where's my arm? Towards the end of the session, I tell my clients, hey, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes before the session, I will let them know, well, you guys, I love what's going on. How about we go to one last location, we shoot there for five or 10 minutes, and then we'll call it a day. So I'm letting them know because sometimes if you just abruptly end a session, they're just like, oh, okay, great. So you're seeding those expectations, what you want, opening that communication. Now, because I want them with me every step of the way, I want them to stay with my vision. And the, re the way I get a vision is by simply setting up a photography map. We're going to go to point one, we're going to go to point two, we're going to go to point three. Each of those locations, we're going to be shooting it slightly differently than 10, 15 minutes before the shoot ends. But like, hey guys, now we're going to that last location. This is going to be great. Stick with me. Thank you guys so much. Blah, 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 blah. Stay ahead of them. Now, before the clients leave, I will inform them of when they should see a sneak peek to their blog post. I say, oh, it'll be in about a week, but I post a sneak peek the day after. And then I tell them, your gallery should be online in about two to two and a half weeks, but I will, pro I will show them their gallery in about one to one and a half. That is what my timeline looks like. So we're going to get into the specifics of how to shoot an engagement session, specifically how we will shoot the not engagement session for Samantha and Taylor so that you guys can see a beginning, a middle, and an end. But I actually want to look, I want to walk you through what transparency looks like and how I communicate with my clients. Because I can say, yeah, you do this and you do this, okay? Right? But then there's something else in actually showing what my inbox and communication with Samantha looked like. Now, please forgive me if this is not of interest to you, but I think that it does bear to kind of show the type of relationship that I'm building with a complete stranger far in advance to us meeting. That's the goal. It's not to say, like, Jasmine, you have a typo. No, it is. And maybe I do have typos. I have typos. This is how I roll. But how I get to this point, how I make them comfortable, how I define my my role as a professional photographer is done just this way. We had not met, we had not spoken on the phone, and we had, I had just sent her that email of preparation that I just told you about, right? My expectations, how many outfits, how many locations, let me know. I had just sent her that. And after she had said, we're gonna shoot on this date, and I said, perfect. And then she had sent me an email, and she said, Jasmine, I'm so sorry. My mom was unexpectedly uh, scheduled for a round of aggressive chemotherapy, and I'm her primary caretaker. Is there any way that we can switch this? And I emailed her back, and I said, absolutely. These are the days that work for me. You let me know. And she let me know the day before the session. And I think it's really important to deal with people with grace surrounding elements that they cannot control. So this was her response. Hi, Jasmine. Your email seriously made me cry for so many reasons. First of all, I'm ecstatic to hear about your mother being in good health after such a battle. How cute that she is voting. I let, her, I let Samantha know, I forgot. I let Samantha know, I said, my mother, she, Samantha knew nothing about me, she knew nothing about my story. I said, my mother was diagnosed with brain cancer that seeded into her central nervous system. I know what it's like to be a primary caregiver. I know that what schedules look like and how appointments come up unexpectedly. I am here for you in any way, so you let me know and we'll be flexible. And I also told that my mom is voting for like her wedding dress and for her bridesmaids dresses, so. Um, but she really, and my mom is all about this wedding. Uh, she said, but I'm so sorry your family endured that and it breaks my heart to think of all that you went through. It is. It truly is the most challenging time any of us have ever faced and every day is just a big question mark. Having said that, it's so comforting to know 
that you have an understanding for our situation. We really appreciate you being flexible. May 4th works for us. We will put that down. When it comes to locations, we actually wanted your opinion. There's a beautiful place in Redondo Beach where Taylor and I go hiking. It's called Abalone Cove. It's breathtaking right off the cliffs of Palo Verdes. However, should engagement shots be done in a similar setting as the wedding? Since this is an oceanfront place, we didn't know if we think it would be, we didn't think more of a rustic location would be better since the wedding is at a winery. If that is the case, there's plenty of places around us with that feel. Thanks so much, we can't wait to meet you. My response, hi Samantha, some of the greatest things cancer gives is patience, flexibility, and understanding. If nothing else, it's a, te it's a great teacher of compassion. May 4th is locked as yours. We'll settle time once we solidify the location. Until then, let's chat about logistics. The only rules for an engagement session are, one, you should feel at home in the location. Two, you should be able to freely express affection and emotion in the location. Three, you should, at full, well, you should be at full liberty to have fun. Four, you should feel beautiful in this location. Do you guys see what I'm doing? I'm telling you what I have done, and this is how it's working specifically for her. As long as the location fits within these parameters, we are good to go. On that note, you mentioned a hiking trail. Are there trees, shrubbery, what type of trails? Why am I asking this? Anybody, just shout it out and I'll repeat it. So, sh shoes, absolutely. That's a total girl answer, but yes. Uh, <laughs> shoes, because if she's wearing high, if she's going wearing high heels, which most girls do, you have to be, bring a pair of flip-flops and then we'll change into them. I also was asking because I needed to know what kind of light I was working with, having never been to that location. So I ask, are there trees? Because then I know, great, I can shoot in open shade and I could rock that at least at the beginning of the shoot. Um, do you have photos of the environment? This would be super helpful in advance knowing what we're working with. The engagement slash wedding location doesn't have to match, so err on this side of where your heart leads. Can't wait to hear from you soon. Um, these email correspondence happen between two days. Her response, I love your look and outlook and everything, and I can already tell we're a perfect fit. We will be working together. Okay, we all will be working together. Well, she thinks we're a good fit. Um, and what is this based off? She thinks we're a good fit based on two emails. That's great. That's awesome. If I can show somebody that I'm a good fit in two emails, I know that anybody can do the same. Here are some pictures, but it, not, it does not do it justice with a simple camera. There are an air, the area we enjoy the most is actually right by the water with sea caves and tide pools and such. When you catch it at the right moment on the right day, the colors of the water and rocks and the atmosphere are simply gorgeous. You feel like you're in another world. There's also a little beach section. Pick attached before entering the cave, as well as more hiking looking locations along the way to the sea caves, picture attached. There are a lot more images on Google search of Abalone Cove too, but I hope this gives you a general idea. Let us know what you think. Okay, this is one of the photos she sent me. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we have lots of rocks, no trees, and lots of dirt. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I go to Google. And I'm like, please, 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 what am I working with? So I got a general idea of what I'm working with, but I knew that I had to arrive really early in advance to see what am I working with and how difficult is it gonna be to shoot in full sun. You guys will see uh, the, the video and how all of that actually happened. And I actually uh, emailed the producer that night and I said, you know, we got through the shoot and, and things ended well, but I just wanna let you know, like in the beginning of the footage, when I'm actually walking around during the pre-shoot, explaining what I'm looking for, you might have to edit some of that stuff out because I was like, on camera, they're like, okay, so tell us what you're thinking. I'm like, what I'm thinking? I can't do this right now. I can't. I can't do this. I was like, my hair is like out to here. You can't, like the mic, it's like, and I was like, I have nowhere to shoot. What am I gonna tell people? I have nowhere. <laughs> like, so I was like, just cut that out. Okay, so now that it said, it may or may not make the edit, but I was like, you will see me kind of just be real like in that second and just be like, I'm having a moment. I don't know where to take these people. And it was to such a degree that I'm walking around and JD's like, I think you should just do this on yourself. I will do this by myself. I will find these locations by myself. I was so worked up about it that these are Google images that just didn't do you any good. What I respond, this is gorgeous. I will arrive early because, because it's gorgeous to her, right? The better experience she's having, the more she's gonna trust that I will be able to document it. I will arrive early to ensure that we have a good understanding of how the shoot will unfold, but ideally, we'd love to end the shoot at the tide pools and cove area, setting expectations. Again, sunset is slated, because there's a, a web app, it's like, oh, not a web app, a website, like sunsetsunrise.com, and I figured out the date, the location, and then it'll give you sunrise, sunset. Sunset is slated for around 7.30, so we'll start at 5.30 p.m. sharp, because the cameras were coming, 
um, with Creative Live, I decided to extend the shoot a little bit. Otherwise, I would have started 30 minutes later to keep the engagement session an hour to an hour and a half. That's like the, the time I think is the best. Anything beyond that, it becomes a little bit more taxing. Please let me know if you plan on bringing changes of clothes as this will help me draft a perfect timeline. If so, we'll shoot one outfit on the trail in the leafier environment or as much as possible. And the second outfit will be by the tide pools. Let me know what you think and we could take things from there. Here's my cell phone if you need anything day of. May I have your cell for emergency contact only, can't wait. Lastly, I need an exact address of where we'll meet just to make sure everything is perfect. Thank you, JSTAR. Hi, Jasmine. The only question actually still I had were in regards to outfits. Do you recommend having two outfits? I sh and should I wear white, or is that what most people wear for a session like this? Given the setting, I didn't know if you had some suggestions. She's asking for help, so I need to position myself in a place of authority by saying, oh, yeah, I can totally answer all of these questions. Hi, Sam. Yes, two outfits is nice for options. Sometimes one outfit photograph is better than another, or sometimes it's just nice to have a variety. Feel free to wear clothes that make you feel gorgeous, amazing, and confident. This is my biggest advice. Are you guys seeing the pattern again? I think this is like the third time I'm telling her, I want you to feel beautiful and I want you to feel confident. Stay away from patterns that can be a wee bit distracting. You can absolutely wear white. I love it. But no, there isn't a set rule for what should be worn at the engagement session. The idea for the shoot is to make you feel like the photos you receive look like they could grace a magazine. Oh, maybe like the knot. So don't hesitate to get creative and have fun. Does anybody notice that I chose, uh, let's see, photos that they can look like a magazine? Because that's my, one of my words, editorial. And creative and have fun, which is another one of my words. I'm preparing her for the types of photos that I want. If you need more help or insight, please let me know. I'm here for as little as much advice as you need. If you'd like, we can loop in Jeannie, her wedding coordinator, into the alpha conversation since she's a legitimate fashionista. I'm going to empower Jeannie, the coordinator, to be part of the conversation if she so chooses. Now, uh, Samantha responded and said, thank you, that works. The day of the engagement session, this is what I send her. Happy engagement session day. I want to remind her. I just want there to be no miscommunication. I'm excited to meet you, and I know great things are in store. Here is my cell in case you need to reach me. Can, I, can you send me your cell in case I need to reach you? This is the second time that I asked for it because she didn't give it to me the first time. I'll see you at 5.30 at Abalone Cove. She sent me her phone number, and that was that, and which was great because had I not had her phone number, I would not have been able to text her. So this is the dynamic. You have now seen how I prepare my clients. You now will be able to fully understand what went into preparing them as I shoot the engagement session. Now, these emails happen about two days, and at this point in our relationship, I don't know them too well yet. But up until this point, she has said that she thinks I'm the perfect photographer for her based on nothing but online presence. In a future lesson, I'm going to talk to you about how the shoot unfolded, how we got through those difficult things in the beginning. And just like when she had sent me those photos and then I respond and say, it's gorgeous. The, the response was, oh my gosh, it's so windy, but we're just going to get some great windblown photos, right? I mean, you have to put a silver lining to every possible experience. So your homework, what I want you to do is I want you to make a list of ways that you can prepare your clients for an engagement session in advance. Then what I want you to do is to create a template that outlines your expectations, that outlines your outline of the day, and that outlines your prep tips. Expectations, outline, and prep tips. Uh, I have done this in a series of email templates. The thing that I hear the most from photographers is they don't know how to put words around what they always want to say in almost 10 years into it. I've just decided to create a little system. You can find my personal preparation email templates on jasminestar.com jasminestarstore.com. And lastly, what I want you to do is I want you to exceed their expectations by managing their expectations. I want you to find ways to outline the shoot and what the shoot will entail to prepare you for the things that you want. Now, um, I think I'm off with my keynote just a little bit. Oh yeah, here we are. Perfect. Exceed expectations by managing your expectations. Um, thank you guys. I am excited to show you what the shoot will actually look like. And on that note, we can open it up for questions and answers if you guys have them. Great. So if we do have questions in regards to preparing clients, uh, we'll just make sure that you guys have a mic. OK. Um. Yeah, so my question, it seemed like with that email exchange, like 
that's pretty extensive. And I can imagine that she really felt taken care of after all of that interaction. Um, full disclosure, I'm not great at that continual interaction and getting back to somebody immediately um, with that. So I want to know, like, what would your recommendation be um, to create kind of canned templates and just do it that way and try to, or to outsource or? Um, well, it depends. It depends on what type of brand you want to build. In, in its most basic form, I believe that you can build a personal brand and you can build a business brand. I have chosen to build a personal brand, so to outsource uh, my email, it would be a disadvantage to me because people have become accustomed to my voice and accustomed to the emotional connection that we're creating prior to the shoot. On a side note, I want to heavily encourage you that the, that the generation of, of people getting married mostly belong to the millennial generation. The millennial generation has high values for constant contact, quick and swift service, and personalization. So if email is a pressure point for you, then you need to say something needs to change. It's maybe if you have a business brand as opposed to personal brand, you can turn over that responsibility for email. Or like what I do is I allocate an hour and 10 minutes every single day to email and that's where I start my day. I start my day with my inbox and I will only do what I can get through in an hour and 10 minutes. I prioritize client emails go on top, family emails go on bottom, business um, in the middle and business emails go on the bottom. If I cannot finish all my emails in an hour and 10 minutes, they get pushed back to the next day, but I can guarantee that my clients are getting a personal response within 24 hours. That is a high value point for a lot of the brides that I am booking because they're educated professionals, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're um, CPAs, they want it now. They don't want to wait 24 hours for it. And I think that it goes back to creating the type of experience. So if it's not something you're good at, then I would take a step back. Yes, abdicate the responsibility if you're building a business brand, but if you're building a personal brand, you need to just reshift your day and say, these hours, nobody can talk to me. I need to plow these through to make sure my clients are taken care of. Sorry. <laughs> Bummer, take care of my clients. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, we'll go uh, Mike here, and then we'll go back. I guess this one ties into the same. Do you see a benefit to using email that extensively over just having a phone call? Because in my, my experience was I would just call them, but then they would have no resource to refer to if they were having questions about the session. So two things, two things to that. One, I think it's a generational thing. I think that uh, millennials value electronic communication. And two, it's a legal thing. The little law school that I did have is like word of mouth is not admissible. It's a he said, she said. So I would prefer to have detailed email exchanges. We said 5.30, if you show up at 6.30, no, we said 5.30, and here it is in the email. Um, I also don't communicate with my clients by way of Facebook, and I try to limit texting to a minimum. So much so that Facebook has not been yet um, qualified as admissible evidence but email has, if we ever got into a legal altercation. It has not got to that point, but if a client uh, texts me, because a lot of clients prefer text, they'll say, oh, do you think we can add an hour to the wedding? I go back to my inbox, and I'm like, hey, Kim, so excited for your wedding. I see that you texted me about adding an hour. Can you email me back just to approve, and I will amend your um, invoice? And she says, yep, great. So email for me is always, um, always, always that thing. So my question goes back to, you know, responding right away. Do you ever find yourself um, needing or responding on the weekend or after hours? And how do you handle that when, if there's an expectation to be respond yes, immediately? That is an absolute great, uh, uh, great question. So I respond to my clients within 24 hours, Monday through, I would say maybe Saturday morning if it's client. Um, and if a client emails me Saturday afternoon, I don't feel the pressure unless, if the bride is not getting married in the next seven days, I, have, I give myself latitude. If a bride is getting married within seven days, I respond to her email immediately, because I know what it felt like to be a bride planning things, and to wait a full day for a response was so overwhelming. So I need to make sure that I'm delivering exactly what she wants. Now, um, if, I am, if I am working or if I'm not working on that Saturday, I will respond to the email on Monday and be like, hey, thank you so much for your flexibility and patience. This weekend I usually work, which is opposite schedules of what you have, but let's start this Monday morning off addressing exactly what you want. Then I go into that. So I set expectations. No, I will not respond to text message or answer my phone if it's from a client after 
Like, no, you can't text me at 10.30 and then expect a, a, a response. Like, I'm not, I'm not a girlfriend, I'm, I'm a hired creative for your day, and we have a personal relationship, but not that personal. I need to draw that line. Awesome, anything, there's another question? Yes. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but I was just going to ask, for locations, do you always choose the, choose the location or do you get your clients to choose them? And That's a great question. Why, like, why do you choose to do it the way you do? I request that my clients all choose the location because, and maybe this is just a little bit of legalese in me, if they are unhappy with the results, I never want them to look back and be like, I can't believe you recommended us going to the beach. Like, don't you know we're snowboarders? Like, no, I don't know where you're comfortable. I don't know where you feel okay to make out. Like these are things, but it's really true. I mean, it's true. So I actually don't want to at all be responsible. Now I would say by and large, my clients pick really cool places. Um, um, not the engagement session that I did with the knot, but the one before it, I had clients who reside in Los Angeles and they said, oh, do you think that we can shoot in our backyard in our home? And I said, absolutely. I would have never thought to say, let's shoot in your home. And when we got there, it was such a great session because it felt entirely just like them. And that was like perfect. Now there have been times where I get to a location and I'm just like, oh man. And I think there was a little bit of that at the not engagement session where I was just like, okay, there, there's not a tree here. It's like a big field and it's so bright and it's so windy. And then to get down to the beach, it was like a steep climb down these like switchbacks. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It wasn't until we were going down the switchbacks that I literally saw like a two foot by two foot pocket of shade. And I was like, oh, this is what I exactly planned, you guys, stand right here in the shade. And I was like, cry, like tight cropping. Um, so that's how I looked. And I think that, yes, it could be a potential disadvantage, but it also forces you to stay on your toes. It could be easy to be like, there's this great park by my house. And then you just go through the motions. Like, you know the spots, you know the light, here we go, rigmarole. But I don't think you get stuff that you're really proud of. And I will say that I'm dang proud of the not engagement session because it, turned out so much better than what I thought it was going to, and they were really happy, and we're gonna get into, uh, into what that looked like for them, too. But that was a really good question. Uh, was there another question? Yes. I'm just curious if you have like a uh, like scheduling software resource that you use to manage all the dates and coordinate um, with the client. <laughs> no, JD, please. <laughs> Please, oh, please. That man is just like so chill, like so chill. Like uh, we share a Google Calendar, but you can see, and this is the answer, is that we use a Google Calendar, which is not an advanced system, but it definitely works for us. And so I'm like, JD, anytime you do anything, you must add to this calendar, because this is our master calendar. It's like Homeboy will add like one thing every four months. So um, no, he's not exactly our go-to guy for organization. but. Um, so when, I, when we talked about how I email clients four weeks in advance to their engagement session. Once we establish the engagement session, I will back it up four weeks and write a little note in my Google Calendar. Send Kim in, um, email engagement tips. And then um, as we get to the wedding, we're gonna talk about pre-wedding workflow, like what the things that I would do. The things that I need to do is to four weeks, six weeks in front of the, the wedding, I schedule it in my calendar. Send email prep tips. If I'm flying for a destination wedding, and I know that it's gonna be a destination wedding, I back up 90 days from the point of which I need to leave, because that's traditionally the best prices that you can get for tickets. And I email my clients the day, like 91 days, before I want to buy, and like, hey guys, 90 days is traditionally the best time to get international, um, sorry, domestic tickets. So if tomorrow is approved by you, I'm gonna do a cross-reference, I will send you an invoice according to what I found, and you guys can give me the final approval. So I have all of this done in my Google Calendar. It's not extensive, but it definitely works. Yes, we're gonna bring a mic up here. Perfect, we'll pass it on that way. Thank you guys so much. I just had a quick question about scheduling engagement sessions. Something I've been running into is um, couples wanting to schedule their sessions on the weekends. And I may be available, but I kind of like to take advantage of the off-season yes. weekends. How can I convey to them that I would love to do them on the weekdays? How do you work with that? Um, so after the, client, uh, after the client books me, um, I will send them uh, about a few weeks after because I don't know how far in advance they want to do the session. So a few weeks after we book, I'm like, hey, I just want to let you guys know I know that your wedding's in August. Let me know 
what you guys have in mind for the engagement session. I shoot engagement sessions Monday through Thursday because I'm usually working on the weekends. By saying usually working, you're actually conveying, if I'm not working on a wedding, I'll be working with my husband and dog at a park, you know, enjoying the sun. <laughs> but, so you set those parameters before because if you say, when do you want to do it? And they're like, Saturday. Oh, I can't do Saturday. Sunday. Oh, I can't do it. It's like, instead of saying no, you set the parameters first and then take it from there. Thank you guys so much. These are awesome questions. Thank you. Awesome.